It is time for Star Trek Universe, and in this episode, we discuss Discovery 504, Face the Strange, after these words from our Mystery Crenum Chronophages. <laughs> Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on two lifelong friends chat about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I am David C. Robertson. Dave, how you doing, buddy? I'm here. I'm, uh, you know, slugging along, trying yeah. to trying to get everything I need to get done. Yeah, uh, same, same. Yeah. I got a uh, lawnmower this week. Yeah, for the first time, I'm trying an electric lawnmower. You know, better Ooh. for the environment. You don't mm-hmm. have to get oil changes. You don't have to go get gas. Mm-hmm. You just like charge up a battery. And I bought three batteries thinking I'd be able to like hot swap them in and like keep it going and finish the whole yard. And uh, no, I know I haven't been able to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Possibly the technology isn't there yet. <laughs> it's not. And, like each, each battery gives me like 15 minutes and I have a pretty big yard. So I kept having to pop them out, pull them out. The problem is when you pop them out, they're too hot to charge. Like they get too mm-hmm. heated. So then I have to wait like 30 minutes. So by the time I can charge the first one I was using, the f- I'm already done with the other two batteries. Like it's a real bummer. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I did order two more batteries. <laughs> like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to get more batteries and see if I can, like, yeah. So uh, I wish our, I wish we had Star Trek technology, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I used to have a weed eater that you could plug in, and that was cool, except, you know, you had to... Yeah, you on a leash. Be, you had to be plugged in, which sucked for the whole... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Outskirts of the yard. I will say the weed eater used a lot less power. I, I ordered the, the mower came... There was, like, a, a deal on Amazon that came with, like, a weed eater and, a, like, head trimmer and whatever. And yeah. I just, like, ordered the package or whatever. And so uh, the weed eater seems like it lasts a while. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, we have battery operated weed eater and uh, blower maybe, and uh, mm-hmm. hedge trimmer thing, and man, it just they conk out so quick. Hmm. It's just uh, Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ. I, I know that we. I, I just meant to mention this and move on, but I feel like we're, we're yeah. I don't. I, I, the cool thing is the batteries with this one about all the same brand. So they all mm-hmm. came as a package, all the same brand. So I can actually use the mower batteries which are like i don't know like 30 times larger more battery capacity i can use that on the weed eater because it's the same battery like size and everything and voltage it just has a lot more capacity and so Mm -hmm. i can use it and then it'll last i I don't even know like i have no idea i I don't i don't think i think it would last a long long time yeah i wish they were more like my my drill battery i think i uh last charged that in 1972 <laughs> um <laughs> it just depends on how much you're drilling man i don't drill a whole lot but it's always ready for me i don't know like, this is <laughs> I've, magic i've had that too and like i basically <laughs> i have a bad habit i buy a drill charge it up and then it takes so long to need to charge it that i lose my charger and then it's time and then I just buy a new drill. I've done that like five times over the course of my life where it's like going through a season of needing to drill things like moving apartments, moving houses, stuff like that. And then like I just dr- I buy a drill. That one charge lasts so long and then I don't know how to charge the thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've 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 never lost that. I've always been afraid I was going to. Mm-hmm. But I just look for the biggest group of spider webs and go, Oh, it's gotta be under there. Yeah, and it always is. It's like ah, yes, because <laughs> uh, I haven't used it. Yeah. Um, well, we watched a Star Trek episode. We did. Yeah. What What'd you think of uh, this? Is uh, was the third, fourth Discovery episode this season? Fourth. Yeah. What'd you think? I really liked it. Yeah, it's good. I thought it was a great episode for the most part. It. it yeah, I agree. It's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, there's various kinds of holes I can try to punch in it. But overall, like it was a, it was the classic sort of like somebody's trapped in a loop, somebody's trapped in a temporal problem, nobody else knows what's going on thing, which is always kind of fun. Like the whole like mm-hmm. you have fourteen minutes to solve the problem. Oh, next time you're gonna have eight minutes. You know, I, it, it it was good. There was enough like flexibility that uh made 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 it fun. I, I did I did feel 
So there's been a lot of time with, is it Rainer? Captain Rainer? Commander Rainer yeah. now? Um, they've spent a lot of time with him this season. And I do feel like if it, they knew it was the final season when they were writing this season, they probably wouldn't have made the first four episodes so Rainer focused. Yeah. You know what I mean? It feels like they're trying to introduce a new character into the cast, so, which is what they're doing. So they're spending all this time with him. Or maybe he's just a character that's going to, you know, they need for this season. Mm. Either way, it's the final season. We're, we've got, what, 12 episodes, 13 episodes? Do we know? The actor did uh, 10 episodes, and the actor did say that he oh. was supposed to come back for season six, and he was going right. to be a main character. Okay. Yeah, it just feels like you, you got 10 episodes total, and you use four of them to really focus on a brand new character in your final season. It feels like they would have made a different decision if they'd known this was their last chance to make these stories. And I mean, like, not like they're not getting time with other things, other, other characters, and it's not like they're not you know, having some shared time in each episode, but like it's a lot of Rainer time. <laughs> yeah. It is a lot of Rainer time. Uh, and I liked what we got of him. And, you know, I'm, I'm going into this, like knowing that they didn't know it was their final season. So I'm, I'm willing to give them, uh, some grace on that. Yeah, for sure. And I don't mind what they're doing with him. It's just, it's you. I want them to wrap up the characters and storylines that we've been dealing with for five seasons. I, I agree, and but uh, you know, then again, maybe they wouldn't have changed anything because that's that is one of the things that Discovery does a lot of is bring in new characters and still just ignore all these other characters that <laughs> have been on the crew. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I really liked this episode. Um, just starting off. Man, I, I love that the episode is called Face the Strange and that they focus so much on, like, by way of showing us the past, like, showing us how much the characters have changed, the ones that we know very well anyway. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the crazy different stuff that's gone on during Discovery. And, of course, you know, Face the Strange and it being about changes. You know they're referencing the David Bowie song, Changes. Uh, mm. You know, cha 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 changes face the strange. Okay, I didn't. Know I love that. that. Got it. I love that. Cool. I uh, yeah. That's. I didn't like, even know the title until you said it when we got on. <laughs> yeah, and then I if, don't know that. I know that song, but I didn't know those lyrics. So that's cool. Yeah, if you uh, like, if you really want me to like an episode of anything, make the title of it a Bowie reference, and I'll probably like it a lot more. <laughs> it's a good. Um, it's a good first impression. It is, but uh, yeah, I I love the brutality of of Mock and Lol. Uh, sorry, hmm. Mall and Lock. <laughs> dyslexic that right up. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I love that they're looking for freedom and that the writers chose to show like a real relatable sweet moment with them as the after effects of one of their most brutal moments was playing out. Like yeah. they're hugging and kissing and talking about being free and this poisoned dude is like grasping at his ankle. Yeah, it's a really great uh way to show who their characters are because like they are people they have their own like desires they're not completely mustache twirly but they're like having that moment over a, a dying man which she did say he was one of these men who like had caused her childhood to be so bad like the way he worked at the emerald chain or whatever mm -hmm. and so like it was a revenge thing but still like it it, it is brutal. definitely a bad guy and a brutal move to be like making out over the site of your revenge as they're wheezing their last breath. Yeah. She's still got to become a good guy. stew. Um, <laughs> I do still think there's room for that. You know, if they expand the way, like the knowledge of what happened to them and like, uh, we, we see, we see some of the reasons she is the way she is and give her a chance for redemption, a chance to turn around. But, but yeah, it's pretty brutal. Yeah. This is, it's pretty rough. Um, did you catch with the crinum that it was a crinum chronophage that the little spider was of crinum technology? Um, no. So the crinum were from Voyager's year of hell. Huh? They were the bad guys who kept resetting time and, and okay. that whole year of hell yeah. was because of them. So, and then we have this bit where, uh, Rainer says that the crinum this is from the temporal. This is a holdover from the temporal war. Interesting. 
And I love that the Krenum are involved in the Temporal War. It just makes me want a Temporal War show so bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool, dude. No, I didn't hear, um, I didn't catch that. That's rad. Also, I feel like this episode reminded me a lot of one of Voyager's season final season episodes called Shattered where Chakotay was go like popping back and forth through time mm-hmm. going to some of their more, you know, seminal missions and shit oh yeah the years. that's cool i didn't recall that uh episode i thought this was a pretty cool way to do it especially again knowing it's the final season kind of wanting to see how they're going to wrap things up getting a chance to visit how the beginning was an early early michael burnham and we got i really liked the calypso references in this episode yeah um the fact that zora likes that kind era of music or whatever so are we supposed to presume that that timeline that they're trying to stop now is the Calypso timeline, or is this a different time that they were going to leave the ship and leave it alone? Um, it might be a separate alternate future. It also might be that Calypso never actually happened and that it was just one of Zora's dreams because she was like, am I dreaming? Is this a dream? Mm. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Either I, way you can head cannon it. Sure. I guess, I guess. But that that's kind of weird for for us to see the episode through more through that character's eyes. I'm forgetting the name of the character, and then it'd be her dream. It, it seemed like that was really happening, and I, I don't know. Just this episode showing that that is a possible future for Discovery, having Zora have that uh, intelligence and everything. It just seems like that's a real thing that it did happen um, in some version of the timeline. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think some there's some alternate future where that happened. Yeah, I think so too. And I, and I'm just curious if like what they're telling us with this episode because I believe if I'm not mistaken, Discovery was like it was in a wh- where was it? Do you remember? I, I'm having I thought it was like circling a star or something. I don't remember. I haven't watched it since it came out. I know it was, uh, you know, borderline derelict and about to die. <laughs> Right, right. I, I just I, I couldn't remember if it like it being in the middle of a destroyed Federation headquarters, sort of swirling with other trash, made me sense, or if that's or if it would have had to drift away from that somehow or something. Yeah, I thought maybe it had drifted away, but I'm not sure. Okay. I don't remember. Cool. It was also written by Ma- Michael Shaban, and he's not even uh, doing anything with the franchise anymore at this point. Well, so. sure. But it, it clearly with this episode and then with other little moments they've shown us, I feel like they are, they, they are still keeping in mind Calypso, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They've done several little things to yeah. push that for sure. Mentioning the Vidraish and whatnot. Yeah. I thought this was a good use of the plot to prove that Rainer is wrong about how connection can be used as a strength. Sure. It was a little heavy handed. I, I actually think it's kind of terrible for that because okay. it's like, it's like, yes, connection was used in this episode, but like only in like a very specific time travel scenario where you need to prove you are who you are. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's not like showing it every day to day mission. It's needed. I mean, this is star Trek. It's not like this is the first time something like this has been needed, but right. like, it's still like, look, you better be this kind of captain. You might get trapped in a time paradox. You know what I mean? Like it's a weird reason it's it, it's I don't think that's a that's a good use of it like a good reason to show that but it does show I mean that's what they were going for I just think it was yeah. kind of heavy handed you said and that might be the word for it I don't know it just was like it's a situation specifically designed for that resolution which is mm-hmm. an episode of television that's how they write them but like we need to get there we need to show that rain we need to show Rainer that connection is important how do we do that. Oh, well, it feels like, but that's what it feels. It feels like an episode engineered to show that rather than like them going through a variety of common situations where that's mm-hmm. shown to be important, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure like exactly how they would have turned it around given that characters. It does. It just feel like overall very engineered um, to, to lead here. Yeah. 
But uh, because it doesn't make sense to me that Rainer would be this kind of guy who's like, I don't need to know. I don't I need to have personal connections with my crew. I'm above them. Um. So I mean, you know, taking what, the show for what, what, what it mean? is. Like, as a Starfleet captain, there's like, you need to, and it was something Picard struggled with. Yeah. Not having a personal connection to his crew. But, and then you see in the last episode, he's like, I should have done this years ago, like playing cards and actually being, you know, present with his, with his crew. Right. Uh, And Rainer is very much like a much more jaded version of that, where he's like, I don't need to know these people. It, It messes it up if there's too much connection and it it, it uh, dulls logical d- uh, command decisions and mm-hmm. ex- you know all these things, but you know discovery has always been very much in the vein of we need to be a family more than we are a functioning Starfleet crew. <laughs> yeah, uh, there and it's evident throughout the entire show. Like people are much less. Um, militaristic much less going through proper ranking you know protocols and whatnot mm-hmm. it's just uh I, I feel like in a way this episode is trying to sell the fans on why discovery is the way it is <laughs> like they're like oh you don't like that we all cry and whisper and have all these really like not starfleet protocol ways of dealing with things But this is our strength, and this is, like, every Starfleet crew is a family, and we all find our way to being X, Y, and Z and doing the job, and this is our way. I think they're maybe, maybe subconsciously, but I I doubt it. I think they are trying to, like, make a case to the fans of, this is why this show is a little different. Hmm. And I'm... Iffy about it, but I liked the attempt at least. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I just think different captains are different, and I and I I don't think like I don't think that Discovery. I I, I mean I, I don't follow the online conversations like you do, but like I don't think of Discovery's issues if it has them being that the crew is too soft with each other. Or too much like soft. a family, or whatever. Is that is that is that something that's complained about? Like, I guess I don't. The, I don't is, think the, of that because I mean, yeah, it, like, you've got the same thing with Strange New Worlds. Those characters are very close, and the captain has all the like young ensigns to his ready room or like to his house for to cook for them and stuff. Like it, it's he's he's the opposite of Picard as well, but we don't have that complaint over there. Yeah, I know that that's that you know often the 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 same people who will say you know I don't like Discovery because you know they they cry and they like each other and they they're not like Starfleet officers will come back and go like oh, I love Strange New Worlds finally Star Trek right and I'm and like it's very much the same stuff there's some kind of disconnect going on here yeah I mean I had to say it like because there's a lot of other people probably I'm sure thinking it like the is it just because a female captain versus a male captain and people are looking at it going like, how cool is Pike? And they're just looking for a reason, you know, and even, even subconsciously, they're not, they're just like looking at it and thinking of it as like, Oh, I don't know. The, the look at these, look at these women, female characters being like too emotional, but Mm -hmm. the male characters can be as emotional as they want to be over on strange new worlds. So it's like, Oh, how refreshing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think, I think there's an idea that like, I think that is for, for some people, some of it. Yes. I think that is some of it. And then for other people who don't care for it, I think there's, there's an idea that discovery is very, very sloppy in the storytelling, which it can be. Yeah. No, that, that, that I see, like, that's what I'm saying. Like, is this particular problem of discovery being too, connected and family like is that talked about amongst fans because i haven't heard that but it it is to some degree like it's also like i think there is i think there's more discourse about how the show is kind of sloppy and just lets michael run around and fix everything sure through like crazy action and stuff yeah i think there's more complaints about that honestly but i i kind of feel like the discourse 
Discovery writers might just be kind of going like, no, it's just because of this. Or, you know, like maybe they're kind of cherry picking what they think the fans are really having a problem with. Sure. It sucks because, like, clearly racism and sexism play into these issues of, like, fan reaction. Obviously. And even, like, people from outside the fandom will come in and, like, throw those racism and sexism allegations Mm -hmm. or, like, little bombs into the into the uh, into the show like you, you see it all the time um various like I ba- basically like right wing pundits will be like look how woke this is getting and and they don't even watch yeah. the show they're not fans of the thing they'll be like look at this game it's going all woke and it's like mm-hmm. no they just have a female protagonist it's like what's your problem um yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely the problem is with you buddy um but that is also a really bad crutch to run back to with every criticism. And it's hard, mm-hmm. man. It's really hard. I mean, as a content creator, it's really hard to parse through the criticisms of a thing you're making and go like, what's legitimate criticism and what is just mm-hmm. like people being mad to be mad? And what is a thing to like hear and internalize and change about your product? And what is a thing to ignore because it's just a hater for any myriad of reasons they just don't like you move on you know what i mean it yeah. is hard to know but going go- yeah i hear what you're saying though i think a lot of a lot of the the people who wind up responding to anything about discovery are like have not watched it in years and mm. like because you i i got pop i got popped over to reddit as i saw they had like the little um uh, 504 discussion mm-hmm. and there was like nothing of any intelligence there it was just like let me guess michael saved the day and then cried i'm like you haven't watched it since season one i would assume right so there, there's a lot of that i feel like but- yeah yeah I'm, I'm i'm sure people just have like you know decided they hate discovery and then never gone back yeah th- that's what it is people are just have decided universally as far as like they're just never like they're not going to watch they might watch a trailer but they, they're still going to be like yeah it looks like the same shit right. and uh you can't trust those people but at the same time right. like i do think discovery does have legitimate issues sure that for some reason strange new worlds figured out how to get around for the most part right well I, and i think that a lot of the issue is the balance between a lot for me my personal issues with Discovery are it has it doesn't do as good a jo- when I when I look at those two shows side by side, Discovery doesn't do as good a job balancing um episodic storytelling and serialized storytelling. It just like mm-hmm. it's a little too serialized to the point that like I feel I, I feel I feel like the big story has so much weight hanging off of it. Yeah, I agree with that. I I I feel like Strange New Worlds does a little bit better of a job of really nurturing their characters and giving them room to breathe mm-hmm. so that when they get to whatever the big thing is, we care about what those characters are doing. And like we care, we there's like a, a certain amount of emotional stake in it that yeah. we don't have with Discovery a lot of the time. And there's also a lot more uh, trading the story off to different characters. Like, I feel like you know, for as few episodes as we get, we've gotten stories with almost all of the main characters on uh, Strange New Worlds, and Discovery does tend to be like the Michael Burnham show. Like, uh, mm-hmm. most weeks, you know, very, 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 every, every once in a while we'll get one of another character, but it, seal, it seems like more so than other versions of Star Trek, you know? Yeah, of course, it's easier to just make it about, like, a couple of characters when you only have so few episodes, you know, right. when in the original, oh, yeah, 100%. on the old shows, like, you know, they got 22 episodes to fill. Right. But that's what I'm saying. That's, that's why I'm saying between those two shows, because, um, strange new worlds has found a way to do that. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, discovery is trying to do the big overarching story every season. And they want that overarching story to feel earned and to feel like it has stakes. And so they just focus on that, you know? Yeah. I mean, so I did love this episode. Quite, mm-hmm. I liked it quite a bit, at the, at the very least. Yeah, me too. I do wish 
that they had had Burnham bring up any other damn thing from Arium's past or character other than you sacrificed yourself. Yeah, that was a little silly. <laughs> and then everyone was like, she wouldn't do that. I'm like, Be- they're Starfleet officers. They all probably would, right? <laughs> right, exactly. I was like, guys, you, what you're saying is you wouldn't let her, but like, that's like all part of the deal. You're in Starfleet together. You're all like... You will all do that if you need to, and it is sad that it happened to her, but, like, it is definitely not any kind of, like, proof of who <laughs> Michael is to point at any Starfleet officer and go, one day you will sacrifice yourself for the betterment of humanity, and it's like, but, yeah, hopefully any of us would do that. Yeah, it's, it, that was a silly one, I agree. Yeah, I feel like Burnham would have, since none of them are going to remember it anyway, and Burnham knows this, so she, all she'd have to do is pull out the technology, show it to, Ar- to Arium, and say, "Like, can you like this is from this is thirty second century technology where we we'll, where we will all be stranded soon? Can you just like look at that and tell them that this is this is probably right? Oh yeah, that looks right. That, yeah, that looks like it's not from here. Yeah, cool. that's true. At that <laughs> earlier on in the episode, they didn't know that yet, so there were a few sort of forgivable like them hiding from the other crew members and stuff. But then mm. once Stamets said like. But each loop, we won't be, we, we aren't, a fa- as long as the last one we fix, like, nothing we do will matter, you know? Mm-hmm. Then they're a little free to do whatever they need to do. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> I was very, very impressed because they moved some of the sets around and made it look like the season one and two situation. Yeah, yeah. But there was one glaring error. Uh-oh. The freaking Starfleet insignia in the ready room. Huh. No matter where they were, it was still the 32nd century Starfleet insignia and not the insignia from the first two seasons. <laughs> oh, man, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you got so close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. Um. I don't know. What, what, what you got? Anything else on this episode? Not really. Feedback? Let's hit the feedback. Let's see what other people are saying. Maybe we'll have some other things be spurred on to talk about. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, Andre Sparks says episode forward and a look back. I just got to say the best part of the episode for me was seeing young Michael. I forgot how unhinged she was. I love it. <laughs> Can't wait to see how this episode affects the rest of the season. Keep up the work, guys. Uh, keep up the good work, guys. Thank you, Andre. Um, yeah, I actually agree. And that's one of the things I loved about the episode was it was very much like Michael facing Michael. Mm-hmm. I and agree. the whole, like, that was a really nice touch. The, you know, Michael not believing in herself and being, you know, like they, yeah. they would never, it was, it's that great human condition mm-hmm. uh, statement that Star Trek does usually very well where, you know, to know where we're going, we need to look back and see where we where we've been. Yeah, and to realize that at some point, Michael thought there's no way a mutineer would ever be made captain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She thought her her chances were completely over. Plus, it's just always really nice when uh you get a chance to have characters that have a lot of like deeper meaning and like a lot of exploration, and then like get to see those characters interact and on Discovery. Those are the only two characters we've ever had deeply, dis- deeply, uh, you know. <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm Damn just it. teasing. <laughs> Damn it, Matt. <laughs> yeah, but if there's anyone that Michael trusts the least, it's Michael. So I did love that there was that showdown. And I really loved how good it looked. Yeah, it looked really good. They made, they took great pains to make sure that like you never saw that it was a, you know, either one of them was a, a stunt person. Yeah. Or a stand in. I, I, I thought that too, except for, I think there was maybe one shot. I think it was once she had a uh, older Michael or a younger Michael on the ground passed out. There was one shot where she looked like she was kind of floating over her arms because it was one of the f- shots where they put them in the same shot, you know? So, so mm-hmm. I, that was the only one that I noticed any any kind of seams, I guess. Yeah. For the most part, though, it was really cool. Yeah, I dug it. 
Yeah, man. And also, like, can I just say that I loved Stamets in this episode? Yeah. It's like, just like, I'm in a mood. Get the hell out. And <laughs> yeah, I was grumpier then. <laughs> <laughs> they got out faster that time. <laughs> they were more, did, more scared of your grumpiness than they are, like, spores in their lungs. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so... It's so silly, and it was borderline stupid, but it made me laugh when he was like, I'm actually really concerned that my, that my crew doesn't know that that there is no like spore drive leak or whatever. Yeah, like, me too. That was really funny. <laughs> it's like, oh god. You should know that's not a real thing. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> I really did think that was really funny. <laughs> uh Timothy Castillo writes in, where we where we're going, we don't need warp speed. Hope you're well, Dave and Matt. Life is crazy. This was a really wild use of time travel technology, not by the show, but by Malin, Malin Locke. It's, it seems like it could have had enormous ramifications beyond just trapping a single ship for a while. It's definitely interesting, but Burnham and Commander Captain could have potentially stopped the Discovery from traveling to the future or at least to the proper time, or they could have accidentally given control more advanced tech. Overkill for a trap, in my opinion, especially if you want to definitely maintain the chronological status quo. <clears throat> well, just th- to respond to that, I do think there was a... They had that one line th- th- where they said, like, no matter what they do, it'd be reset or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I think that you kind of get away with that. Like, I, I do... I, well, they did say, like, as long as we get this one thing done, it'll all reset. So I don't really know what that was about. Like, I don't understand fully, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's probably going to be reset, you know, back to the normal timeline. Anyway, the point of it is to trap them in their own timeline. Like if they wanted to go back in time and stop them from traveling to the future or whatever, it would change their future as well. So, you know, if you're like, I want my life to be the same, except they can't. Well, we're just trying to hold them up so that we can do a thing. Yeah. And, and I agree. Yeah. I agree with uh, Tim that I think it like it's overkill for a trap either way. <laughs> it is, like, but it's cool. It is very cool. It is very cool. <laughs> and again, like it goes to that like thing we were talking about earlier. It's like the conceit of the episode and why they did it this way. And it's like, well, they wanted a ch- reason to explore, and like, what are our tools on the board? Well, it could be uh, something Ma and Locke did causes them to go through time. Well, how would that work? And then they like create this device. You know what I mean? Like the the writing f- of this episode feels very contrived to me. But like, mm-hmm. I still enjoyed it. But it's just, just a little contrived. Yeah. Uh. Tim continues, so Adira and Gray broke up. Do you remember that? Just thought we'd check in on that. They seem like good buds, good buds now. Gee, golly. Yeah. You know, I, I liked the scene because you had, you had something for everybody looking back on who they'd been at some point hmm. for the most part. Oh, I and gotcha. so you think that was the chance to get Adira in there? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's where the spider came from. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's, so we had to see where that came from or where that was going, how it came, you know, but I like the fact that like with the episode being thematically like facing the strange of change. Yeah. And, well, I, I, to me, I, you know, last week I spoke about how like <laughs> when you have characters and you're scared to give them uh, like, uh, you know, flaws because there's of certain representation, like, mm-hmm. and, and I do kind of, I, I felt that this week, like we were talking about how per two, how their breakup was a little too perfect or a little too like lacking in conflict. Then to have them reintroduced on the ship. And it's just like, Hey, by the way, not only did we go through that well, but we're also still good buds. It's great that we're staying in touch. And it's like, it felt a little bit like a little more of that to me. Well, yeah, to me, it felt like Adira very much having a hard time and trying to put on a brave face mm. and facing the strange, even though the strange of change, as it were, but also being heartbroken. Like Adira gets off the, uh, for lack of a better, uh, they get off the phone 
<laughs> and and then goes and like just stares at a picture, an old picture of them. Yeah. And you can see the hurt and that this was not what Adira wanted. Mm. I had to I'd have to go back and re, re kind of rewatch that scene because I, I did not take get take that away. I thought she kinda of smiled. It smile, but it was like it was You think it was like a pain smile? Yeah, it was like the smile of remembering good times and missing those good times. Interesting. I don't think I took it that way. I think I took it as like, look how good we are still. Like, uh, look, look, look at the relationship we had and how it's still a strong friendship. Like, yeah, I did not, I did not see the pain, uh, pain in her eyes, but maybe I missed it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just took it a certain way. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, Tim says, I love the Burnham v. Burnham, uh, v. Burnham fight, and it made a lot of sense to me that the person she would trust the least would be herself. Hey, Tim, I like this episode overall. Hey. I thought it was a cool bit of time travel trouble, and we got to know more of Commander Captain. <laughs> 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 I wish the bridge scene with Arium didn't exist so that the scene between Commander Captain and Reese could breathe a little more because there's a good reason that commander captain that's Rainer y'all doesn't know anything about these people, but Burnham should know these people really well. And I don't feel like her scene with the bridge crew is convincing. The Arium stuff felt forced. She is definitely into killing herself for the crew though. Contrary to popular belief. Yeah, I do agree. Like, I feel like, you know, the only, like, I feel like there should have been some more stuff that like she could have brought up other than, you know, that any of them could have brought up other than you like constitution class starships. <laughs> well, well for Rainer, that was all he knew. Like that's what, that's what yeah, Rainer. So for Rainer, that made sense. Like he had like weaker evidence than, than she did. Mm-hmm. But I, I thought the Burnham stuff w- w- was good except for the Arium thing. And I feel like the Arium thing was just to give a little more like <sighs> emotional I, oomph. Yeah. Emotional oomph. And like, tribute to that character and what and her sacrifice Mm -hmm. and like her in her last appearance here but it doesn't make sense it's just that classic thing of like choosing to have a character moment so like okay i am all about having character moments like i love that in media uh i all your moments should be character moments but you still have to follow the rules of the universe you're setting up. You know what I mean? Or the, the or or you. It's like you're you can't play the game if you're not gonna play on the board. You know? Yeah. And like, <laughs> so 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 in that situation, she needed to convince Arium that she knew her, and so she used the thing from her future, which doesn't make any sense. Like, so it's sort of that thing of just like this. We want to deeper character moments so we're going to ignore the actual rules of the situation and nah, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't yeah. I had trouble with with that specifically. Yeah. Uh Tim says I am a bit harsh and cynical with a bit of this, but I liked this episode. Stamets was great. It was rough that he had to live through having a hole in his torso again. I laughed mm-hmm. when he just yelled at people to get them out of the room. Good idea, maybe do something similar on the bridge. <laughs> it was also fun calling back to Voyager with the bug being from the Crinum, even if that doesn't quite seem to add up, maybe. But whatever, 800 years later from Voyager, so plenty of time. Yeah, I think, you know, they've obviously opened gateways, and there are, you know, all sorts of... I mean, like, the 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 dealer that uh, Mollenlock killed was, was from the Delta Quadrant, was from a species from Voyager, so... Mm-hmm. I'm fine with that. Also, there's been temporal wars. Crenum could have, you know, who knows what's been changed, dude? Who knows? Mm-hmm. In fact, I would much rather deal with <laughs> those questions than most of what Star Trek has been doing lately, period. But anyway, uh, last thought. Totally thought they had traveled to Calypso. It doesn't seem to be the case, but man, they could have just done that and maybe tied a little bow, and they didn't. But oh well. Uh, yeah, I, I think they possibly could have, I think they, I think they actually may have just said, Hey, look, if they beat this level, I mean, season (laughs) (laughs) Calypso doesn't have to happen. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that that, and and that might still be what they're trying to do. It's just, they did not make it very clear, but because I don't remember, I'll have to go back and watch Calypso. I don't remember them 
being or like Zora being in the like middle of a destruction field of Federation stuff. Maybe maybe she was. Maybe the discovery was. But I yeah I, I'd have to go back and look. But I I thought she was like circling a like sun or something like that. Maybe. I don't know. I just I genuinely do not remember. I if, thought that there was wreckage. Yeah, I remember wreckage. I thought it was like. Like like a bunch of wreckage kind of falling into a gravity well of a star is what I, I if mm. that's the case that could be like what they're going for they're like this is you know this is right after the destruction you know a little bit of destruction and then a much later you get the the Declipso episode mm-hmm. so so it's it's possible that's what they're trying for here is that like this is where those like two universes diverge in a wood. If you don't get out of this, that's the Calypso dark future, you know? Yeah. Which would be tying a bow on it, but I just, I didn't know that it made it clear enough. I need to go back and rewatch that scene. Yeah. All right. Jonathan Appleby writes in, says, third host. Hi guys. I love you both, but would it be possible for you to find a third host that actually likes discovery? <laughs> When when one of you is meh on the show and the other of you absolutely shits on everything about the show, I don't really know why you chose to have a podcast about Discovery unless it was just for posterity's sake. Just a thought that someone that actually likes Discovery could actually add to the conversation instead of detract from the show slash franchise. Again, I love you both. However, I hate that you are forcing yourself to watch things that you hate and not really adding any positivity about the show when there are some of us fans that do enjoy it. I hope this is taken in the constructive criticism that it was intended. Uh, thank you for writing in, Jonathan. I, I I love that you love us. Yeah. And and, and uh, love nice. love you back, bud. Uh, sure. <laughs> but I yeah, I, 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 I don't like think you. I don't think either of us hate Discovery. <laughs> Um, no. we, we are, we are critical of it. It may not be our favorite Star Trek series, so we're critical oh, of it. Not. And it like, we tend to compare and contrast our favorite Star Trek series, you know, like, and, and so we versus this and like talk about things that we look could like better or worse, but like, I don't think uh, it's very rare that I hate an, ep- even an episode of discovery. Um, yeah. I just it has its issues, and I'm going to talk about the issues. <laughs> like, it, yeah, it's kind of like just what you discuss when you discuss a show. Um, we can talk, you know, just about what we liked, but that would be sort of the dishonest way of covering it. We liked the show, and we'd cover it because we we would we like all Star Trek. I don't think I think the the only thing I've actually we've covered on this show that I've ever hated are those weird short uh, animated things they did last year yeah those are the only thing i have ever hated from star trek <laughs> and not even all of them some were funny but some of them were just downright terrible i go into every episode of discovery looking forward to it and hoping it is the best star trek i've ever seen um i do think i like discovery best uh, uh bet uh sorry worse or least whatever how you want to put that i'll dislike discovery more than maybe most other star trek and i had thought voyager would hit that mark for me you know consistently and had for decades but you know what going back and looking at voyager it wasn't half bad dude yeah like i so i i think discovery is just a flavor i don't love and i really only have an like a real issue with it when they keep repeating the same mistakes. Right. And, and, and and they, but you know, you know, that's our, that's our opinion. And like, this is a show we make. So like, you know, I hear you. There's a lot of star Trek podcasts. And like, if you don't like the way we cover this, there's lots of ones that do cover discovery. And I'm sure in a very positive light, I, I think we do talk about what we enjoy like this episode we had almost nothing negative really to say like there were a couple little plot things we quibbled with but like yeah we both liked this episode a lot i I thought it was really great but also i do want to point out that we didn't choose to have a podcast about discovery yeah we have a star trek universe podcast exactly we're going to talk about all the star trek because it's our favorite franchise yeah 
Exactly. So Discovery is one of the many shows of the Star Trek universe that we and we love the Star Trek universe. So it's fun to play in this world and talk about it. Yeah, and it's fun for us even if we're not liking a thing. It's still <laughs> yeah. f- fun to talk about like what we would change and how we would change it. And, and it's sort of instructive too, like for watching something you're not that isn't your favorite version of a thing that you love. It's sort of instructive in learning about what you love about that thing. And like, like I, mm-hmm. I've been trying for years to understand more about what I like and what I don't like when it comes to like the balance between serialized and, uh, and episodic storytelling. And I think discovery has been one of the most informative things on that, like metrics I've metric that I've ever known. And it's like, I've been like watching all kinds of episodic and serialized television. And for years and years, I thought serialized is what I want. Why waste time on episodic, you know? And then Mm -hmm. I started watching discovery and there's just a lot of episodes that don't feel like a full meal. Mm -hmm. And then I start going like, Oh no, it is important that when I sit down and give a show an hour, they need to give me a beginning, middle, and end. And like Discovery doesn't always not give me a meal. But it's just sometimes I feel like completely unfulfilled by some of their storytelling because they're not trying to give me a full story in that hour. They're trying to give me a piece of a larger story, you know? Mm-hmm. And like I think if it weren't for Discovery, I would not know that about myself. And so when I'm making a podcast, I'm not making it to necessarily celebrate the thing. Like I, I don't want to. I don't like hate watching things, but I'm also not just gonna blindly talk about how great it is either. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I don't. I personally don't have time in my life to hate watch things. Uh, yeah. Same. I'm just. I'm overwhelmed with all of the stuff I want to get to, and if I hated something, for instance, <laughs> I'd do a DC show called DC on Screen. <laughs> We reviewed like the first uh, four, three or four seasons of Lucifer and hated every episode. And that was totally a chore. (laughs) I had, we have not gone back. Like my co-host has watched the Netflix seasons and said, Hey, it's everything you wanted it to be when it was on Fox. And I'm like, cool. Can't bring myself to watch it yet. (laughs) I just haven't. So, like, I don't hate Discovery. I want it to be better than it is. Yeah. I mean, like, seriously, I, when it's on the on the TV, it's, like, one of my top three shows that I want to see. You know, this, this week I've been watching Fallout, this, and the Planet of the Apes movies for different podcasts. And most of the time mm-hmm. I'm podcasting about things that, like, oh, and X-Men 97. And, like, I'm podcasting about things that, like, I want to watch. And that's why I choose to podcast about them. And, like discovery i get that same like excitement about like oh there's a new episode up yes like and, like should i watch i want to watch it now should i wait till closer to the podcast time so that i uh because i probably won't have time to watch it twice so do i save it and watch it closer to podcast time or do i watch it right now and most mornings i wake up i'm like it's up i'm watching it you know like i watch it for myself yeah. i don't watch it because i need to podcast about it you know and also you know i i know like we could get a third host who was just like bubbly and all about everything discovery, but they're not going to have fun here (laughs) and we're not going to have fun. Yeah. And also I'm curious though, is this like Jonathan like low key trying to like slip his name into the hat for like a third host position? (laughs) That's what I, we, we, cause I know you don't always read the, feedbacks before you put them in the doc or whatever and oh i never did right so so i was wondering when 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 it said third host i was like is this just a person asking if they can be the third host which like i mean the thing is like i don't mind it, there's an editing cost to three people on a podcast that's one of the reasons i try to do as many in t- with two people that because the three and four person cast just require a lot more editing and take a lot more time and effort um but speaking of time and effort, it's also also really hard for us to get together. Yeah, that that's what I was gonna say. Like, but it's also like there's this organizational aspect of like trying to plan ahead, which me and Dave are both bad at. And so like we basically just as soon as the episode comes out, we're like, when can you cast of uh, this day? Okay, that day we we don't have any kind of consistency for that reason. Like we're just really busy. But um, yeah. But uh, but no, I I <laughs> I hear 
Jonathan, uh, that he would like a show. Like, I, I mean, honestly, I really do appreciate you listening, and and, and I, don't, I do not like want you to go elsewhere for your podcast, your Star Trek podcasts. But like, I get it if you don't like our style of podcasting about Discovery. But like, that's who we are, and that's what the that's the kind of show we're probably going to make. Like, we're going to talk about it the way we talk about it. But also to to uh, shine a slightly different ang- uh, light on a different angle of this, like. My top two Star Trek shows are DS9 and the original series. I love the original series. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely head over heels in love with Star Trek, the original series. And I don't know if you've listened, John, Jonathan. I don't know what you want to be called. Sorry. Uh, Presumptuous on my part there. But like Effie and I have been doing these rewatches of the original series, and she's never seen them before. And I've seen them a million times. But I'm going to complain about shit. Like, we talk about, like, stuff that's silly and doesn't make sense because while I love this franchise, it's also not real. (laughs) And it's not that damn deep. It's just like, I love this. (laughs) This part was stupid. Yeah. You know? There are weeks where we get on here and, like, uh, you I, I I think I'm a little more even keel. Like, I tend to be, like... Either it was pretty good, or it was pretty, it was uh, it was all right, you know. And 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 you tend to be like, it was great, or I hated it, you know. Like you you'll get all like you come on a lot hotter than I do. Like we just swing wider on the spectrum or whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I tend to be somewhere in the middle on almost everything, and I'm just either a little in the positive or a little in the negative. And when you're positive, you're way positive. When you're negative, you're way negative. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about that um, <laughs> just a second ago. Uh, like, for real, like, you are kind of like TNG, and I am Discovery <laughs> as people. Because, like, Discovery has, like, no chill. They they have no subtlety. Like, either, like, and it's from everything to storytelling to presentation. It's like, they are either, like, pew-pew, action-centric explosions and shaky cam or it is a very quiet scene and everyone is whispering and silently weeping (laughs) like there is very little subtlety with any of the characters like they don't Mm -hmm. have a lot of nuance it's just like this 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 and this but like for real like i am kind of an extremist sometimes with my feelings about things like and it doesn't like there's there's stuff like there are times like this episode that we just reviewed where it's like, you know what? Time travel covers a multiple uh, a multitude of sins. I love this idea. I love the Krenum chronophages. I, I I love all this shit. So these two little problems, two or three little problems in the show, that's not a big deal. I'm okay. That's fine. It's annoying, but it's there, and it's but the episode was pretty good. Right. You are more even keeled, but like. If you give me a boring storyline that I don't care about, and then you like fuck up a bunch of stuff, like I'm I'm gonna be like, yeah, that was shit. I don't like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of times, the things that you find as like big fuck ups, I'm like, oh, it didn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. Well, usually it's those little things that are just like the cherry on top of like right. a bunch of stuff I didn't you're like. For you're like reason. eating this terrible shit Sunday, and you're like, yeah, I hated the gumballs or whatever i'm like eh, i don't don't think the gumballs were the problem dave (laughs) but you know what that's the it's part of the reason i love doing the show yeah it is you know i can kind of talk through some of my bullshit about why i didn't like it and sometimes you you pull me back yeah and you're like hey look at this this and this and i'm like yeah you're right that was pretty good yeah i do think that happens a lot and i i think the opposite happens too like you you come in uh, really positive on one, like, uh, and, and and I'll be like, maybe I should be more positive on this. Like, maybe I missed some stuff that I need to like, like appreciate more. And that happens all the time with podcasting too. Anyway, so you're like, Jesus Christ, Dave liked it. Oh, God. <laughs> Even Dave liked it. Yeah, what's wrong with me today? Um, but you know, to be fair, we both kind of hated Discovery in the first season, and then we went back and rewatched it when we started this podcast. We wound up liking it a lot more. Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, we yeah, we really liked the re. I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I hated it during the first season, but I, I I don't think I liked it as much. And um, 
Yeah, I'm trying to think back how I felt the first time I ever watched it. I'll also say, though, during that first run, when I first was watching it and it was coming out week by week, even though I really just didn't like it, I still looked forward to it and was giddy Mm -hmm. every week. Well, and that was the thing. When it came out, there was no other Star Trek in years, and so it felt like such a big deal to like every week to have Mm -hmm. a Star Trek episode. Yeah. It was like... If you haven't hadn't dated someone in a really long time, and then you suddenly get into a relationship, and you know there's going to be fights, and you're going to have disagreements, <laughs> and there are just things that are going to make you <laughs> ill, <laughs> but you're still like, I can't wait to hang out with that person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, what else we got in the uh, feedback? We're we have, we have we have. I feel like we have set our piece on this. I'm. Uh, but uh, I'm so I'm sorry that we are not exactly what you're looking for there on this thing, Jonathan, on this particular yeah. metric, Jonathan. But we do appreciate you listening, and we'll. Uh, but Jonathan, Jonathan, please keep writing in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give us your take. Yeah, tell us, tell us why an episode was awesome. If you if you love an episode, write in about how awesome it was. Absolutely, and we'll just completely and disagree you, with you. It's fine. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> and also, you never know what's going to happen if you keep writing in. Effie, who is ostensibly the third host of this show yeah. at this point, just was a person who wrote in on my other show, DC On Screen, and we became friends, and I've known her for like eight or nine years now, and now she's a co-host on this show, and fills in for my other host co-host on DC On Screen. You never know where this is going to go. Yeah. If you already love us both. Just keep writing in, John. Could could end up being a, a host de toi. And now I'm rooting for you, Jonathan, just to make Stu Little angry. <laughs> here, <laughs> Stu Little over here, trying to be so close to us, trying to convince us that me and him are the same person. Yeah. I mean, come on. It's true. I know it. Like, I really do go it. back and forth. Sometimes I believe him. <laughs> no, you want to know how? You want to know how beyond a shadow of a doubt? Even one of my, I'm such an egotistical piece of shit. Even one of my separate identities would not correct me on the pronunciation of Glasgow. <laughs> Unless you did it just to be corrected, and then. You know, like it was all 40 chest and makes you look stupid, but really every, you know, the joke is on everyone else. I can, I can, yeah, I, I can headcanon this, Dave. <laughs> I can headcanon this. I know you can, but that's mostly paranoid delusion on your part. <laughs> okay, what else, what other feedback we got? We got Stu. Stu Little. Uh, whichever Burnham wins gets to decide on their haircut. <laughs> Quote, 15 hours ago, Locke and Maul were alive in 2024. What a game-changing reveal. Boo, dad joke. Dad joke. <laughs> what? Why was it a dad joke? 15 hours ago, because this is 15 hours ago when we saw the Locke and Maul. They mean 15 hours ago from where Discovery is when we started up with them. Oh, yeah. But... He's saying 15 hours ago, as in in 2024. Oh, like, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, that that I don't know if that's a dad joke. I think of dad jokes as like puns. That's like a misunderstanding how TV works. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Well, we've talked to Stu enough to you know we know that he's uh I don't know. Yeah, we know he knows how reasonably cogent. Yeah, we know he knows how TV works, which is why I'm I feel comfortable yeah. giving him a little bit of shit. Yeah, if there's anything Stu knows, it's how TV works. <laughs> it's true. God help him. <laughs> <laughs> God help me because I know what he's talking about. But I guess I would because he's one, one of your my personalities. personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Stu says, "Really, you're going to transport to the ready room that's right next door instead of walking." Man, you were you were just like an old person. Listen, Stu, it was essential for the plot that they be in the transporter at the time. That's right. <laughs> but also, why wouldn't you? Why would you like 
do that awkward walk across, you know, cause like, you know, like in, inside of the whole crew's head, they're going, Ooh, cause it's like, you know, I want to see you in my office now. Okay. Shit. Mm. No, it's much easier just to hit that transport, man. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, you know, we don't need you to do a walk of shame into the ready room. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's why this show is so uh, snappy with the editing and everything. I know. I mean, like on TNG, they would have had like the slow walk into the room, both of them pulling down their tunics. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Close ups of the characters looking. <laughs> Getting into a chair one way or the other. <laughs> Riker throwing his leg over the back of the mm-hmm. chair. Uh, Stu says, please don't make Rainer a straw man for fans who take issue with how Discovery depicts the crew as overly familiar, emotional, and well, non-officery compared to other Star Trek shows. Because a lot of what he's saying makes sense, and it would be a shame if his arc is just him having to change rather than his different approach bringing something valuable to the ship. I thought it was a missed opportunity that the ship wasn't assigned someone native to this time period in a major role to help them navigate their new status quo. Instead, they just adapted far too quickly. In my opinion, uh, strikingly similar to one of my issues, but, uh, not even an issue, just a, my, one of my thoughts, but I do think that Rainer hasn't just been a straw man. For that, yeah, because you know he, everyone brings something different to the table, and they have shown how his approach, his different approach, brings something valuable to the ship. If they hadn't, Burnham wouldn't have brought him in in the first place. Yeah, you know the yeah, way yeah. he popped in and and helped uh, Tilly and Adira figure out what the hell was going on uh, a couple episodes ago. Right. Well, and I personally think that. It's not about like I think this thinking he's a uh, analog of the fans of Star Trek is is mm-hmm. a little too like uh, Twitter Star Trek Twitter centric. Um, <laughs> I think that the, he is a representative of like just the previous generation and a changing in political times and stuff like that. He's like the class. He's boomer, man. He's like, he's just a boomer. And he's like, yeah, har- you, you kids and your like need for connection. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? But he's also right. And they didn't put a button on it. And I like that about this episode. They didn't like hammer that home, but they went to the future they like he's been saying for the three episodes, three or four episodes that we had that the Breen are mounting a, an attack. And what do we see? We jump to the future and see, like, oh, the Breen destroyed the Federation. Cool. Yeah, that's true. Stu continues I'm half counting this as a clip show. <laughs> kind of fair. <laughs> I would maybe a third counted as one. Mm. Um, <laughs> Stu says, was that a quick and dirty clip? So explanation, I think so. It seems like it, yeah. which I like. I like it a lot. Yeah. It was a mistake for past Burnham not to grab those dangling braids during the fight. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Starfleet doesn't pull hair. It, this is kind of a dirty move, and also uh, the, it was a lot of shaky cam. She might have. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, God. I forgot all about this. After she's nerve-pitched uh, past Burnham, she says, it will be a long road. And Stu says, getting from there to here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That would have been so funny if she'd said that in a line read that wasn't awkward. Like, if there's a way to say that not awkwardly and it's just a really great nod to Enterprise, that yeah. would be really wonderful. That um, that actually reminds me of something I wanted to, to say in reference to the Jonathan email was like, dude, I get, I get being the fan who likes something that everyone else hates. Because I really liked Enterprise and everyone was shitting on it back in the day. Like, you could not mm. find 
a message board that wasn't just like people complaining uh, about Enterprise and how awful it was. I'm like, no, it was good. It didn't break canon. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So I am sorry if we are that for other people. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, quote is fine, is fine. She's fine. I nerve pinched her. You know, you do get how that's worse, right? I don't get how that's worse because the nerve pinch is a pacifistic way of subduing an enemy. Wait, what? Well, did someone say you get how that's worse, right? No, Stu says. Because Michael said, it's fine, she's fine, I nerve-pinched her, in reference to younger Michael. Stu says, oh, and then Stu says, you do get how that's worse, right? I, yeah, I also don't get how that's worse. I do not get how that's worse. That is, like, the nerve-pinch was specifically developed by Leonard Nimoy in the original series as a pacifistic way of ending a fight and subduing a villain. Mm -hmm. Or an opponent, if you will. Yeah. I do not get how that's worse. Mm -hmm. sorry Stu <laughs> telling someone they'd sacrifice themselves for the greater good proves you're from the future and telling the truth huh it came across yeah. like that was supposed to be an unusual trait in a Starfleet officer yeah gotta agree with yeah you. we've covered that <laughs> all this time jumping and conveniently no Lorca appearance a shame also they should have jumped to a time period from like six months ago when Burnham was trying out a mohawk or a mullet you never know. It might be quite stylish in that era. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I kind of was hoping that they would jump to the previous time loop episode. Like the, the whale? No, the, the magic to make the sanest man mad or whatever the hell with Harry Mud. Yeah, the whale. I don't remember a whale. He comes in in the whale. He like... They get a whale into the ship, oh, and then mud right. is inside the whale. Right, right, right. I don't yeah. know why I think of it as the whale episode, but that's how I think of it. If you see a whale, there's time travel if, in Star Trek. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd forgotten all about that. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I thought it would be fun. I was like, oh man, what if they go back to that episode? Yeah, I thought the same thing, actually. And then they didn't. And and like, the the one thing that did, one thing I didn't mention that annoyed me about this episode, sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, was it? <laughs> that's just our new like. Uh, when we started insulting an SE episode too much. Sorry, Jonathan. Um, yeah. W like, uh, is the idea that like Stamets, his mind is outside of time or whatever? Yeah. Or like unaffected by like I I remember that, but like it's such a it seems like a trait that would come in t come in to like the storylines more often. I don't know. I guess it only really manifests when he's going through some sort of time travel. I guess. Okay. Yeah, I guess. I guess, like, otherwise he's still, like, he's not outside of time all the time. He's just unaffected by time, like, yeah, anomalies. He's, he's gone. He's fine. Okay. <laughs> and for whatever, uh, yeah. for whatever reason, while Michael, Michael and Rainer keep their uniforms, for some reason, Stamets just doesn't. <laughs> Well, no, no, that's the thing. So, yeah, they did say that. They said that, like, uh, they're actually, like, they're, they're basically beaming in in their current state each time it resets. Mm. But he is his in his current body, just like he wakes up with a hole in his chest. Right. He's in his current body, but it's just his mind, similar to the mud episode, when he is also unaffected by the time ano time anomalies. His mind, because of his tardigrade DNA, exists outside of the time anomaly somehow. Okay. Yeah. But the way she said it, this episode made me feel like it's something that should be a, a weekly pr thing for him. Like his, his mind, she said something like his mind exists outside of time or something like that, which like would imply that he's seeing all time at all times, which would be make him a completely different human being. Yeah, know? no, I don't need him to become Dr. Manhattan. Right. That's kind of how, what I was like, is that a everyday thing for him? I thought that was just like... I don't know. I guess the time anomaly thing, which I guess is what they're saying, but the way she said it sounded weird. Yeah. I just need Stamets like sitting on the hull as they're going to war warp, and he's just like, I grow tired of these humans and the tangle of their lives. <laughs> 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 Stu says they can fix body parts being rapidly aged to decrepit state. Since when? 
And to that, I say, <laughs> since when have we had that issue to even wonder about? Well, I would say, like, if they can fix that issue, they could also basically de-age anyone. Yeah, but it's Star Trek, so, like, Roddenberry rules. They, they, they grow old, but they value it. And yeah, sure. Bullshit. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Stu says, no, seriously, I feel like we need to go back to explore the hand thing. This seems yeah, like a huge... I thought they were going to leave it like that. Uh, and then he would just have to have a messed up hand for the rest of the season. Um, and I thought that was kind of cool, but then they just changed it back, which annoyed me. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't like the lack of stakes there. No, I was fine with it. Uh, I kind of wanted it to be like, no... I, yeah, like I, I am always in favor of lopping off a limb and putting some sort of like technological prosthetic on. Yeah, because like to me it shows stakes. Like I wish Picard had like straight up lost an arm or something in mm-hmm. Best of Both Worlds, and like would have to have yeah. like you know a Nathan Summers cable arm or something. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But also wanted the same thing for Voyager. Like I wanted the Voyager to be like almost unrecognizable if you'd only seen season one by the end of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, but yeah, he says uh, this seems like a huge deal in a franchise that has depicted aging as still a detriment and also uh, has frowned upon taking artificial measures to combat it. Is it just because it's a hand and not a major organ that makes it possible? or And how is it done? Gene therapy? Some sort of reverse polarity? Chroniton saturation? I need more information. You know, I don't. If that's where they're going with it, I'm just like, you know what? I don't need the TNG technobabble explanation. Just, okay. Yeah. Uh, this was a fun diversion that didn't do much for the overall plot, but did move Rainer's relationship with the crew along a bit, though it was still a bit too much putting the onus on him to change for my liking. I'll also point out Maul was pretty cold-blooded in the opening scene, so maybe she can't be turned good, but come on, this is Discovery. They're not going to have Book fail to make a connection with his quote-unquote sister. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you were talking about it earlier, is it still is it still on the table? It should become good, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. His like because of the book connection, if nothing else, mm-hmm. that's a really good point. The fake book connection. Mm. Um, but I do think I do disagree. I think Rainer ne- does need to change because the whole point of Star Trek is that humanity needs to change. So like, no matter how much we like a character, they need to have some kind of uh, metamorphosis. Sure. Well, I mean, that's even if not Star Trek, it's just that's storytelling. Oh, yeah, also that. And yeah. for a great example of someone we like who never really changes, I present Harry Kim. Mm. On Voyager. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. So uh, we got one more, not about this episode, but Paramount, okay. Paramount put. Uh, the 2009 the Kelvin vs. prequel movie on the official slate as Star Trek right. origin movie. Yeah. And Tim Castillo uh, sends us an email inter prequel. Could the 2009 yeah. prequel be a Jonathan Archer story? God, I wish. Why can't hmm. we get anything other than Picard in the time after TNG, DS9, and Voyager? By saying this next stuff. I'm not saying that I don't like the shows out now, but to me, everything, everything so far feels ancillary to whatever is going on with the Federation and Starfleet proper in the years and decades following Voyager. Picard had an interesting perspective, but it raised so many questions, as has Discovery. Am I alone in feeling that the timeline following Voyager is the present timeline? Or do you think Disco is now the present timeline? Or maybe they don't want us to consider the idea of a present timeline. If so, that's kind of a bummer to me. But I guess I'll just have to learn to accept that. Maybe it's just that it felt like Voyager and DS9 left a lot of stories or ideas open and unanswered somehow. Perhaps Prodigy Season 2 will be the outlet for that kind of thing. And if so, I'm looking forward to it. But I'm greedy, and I want more. (laughs) Am I making sense here? I think you're making some sense. Yeah, I think so too. Like, because we're old dogs, as Rainer would say. 
Mm -hmm. And we grew up on Voyager and TNG and DS9. We want to see that shit continued. And we want that to be the present timeline. Well, and they did bring it back with uh, Picard. They did. And and that feels and that, that and the success of that show and everything I think that like just that kind of feels like the present to us still like at the post Picard era now feels like the present um, and all those and, and partly because all those characters that we love um, from that era that are the most known Star Trek characters to the public they're all the age they are and if they want to come back and stuff like. All the DS9 characters, all the TNG characters, all the Voyager characters, like, it just feels like they would bring them back, and it's going to be around that Picard timeline, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. So, I I, I am, I feel the same way, and I hope they're able, I hope that, I wish they would stick to, like, one time as sort of being the primary time, and these ancillary stories, I mean, prequels, things that are way in the future, whatever, it's all kind of, uh, I, 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 like, like, I don't think this is great for um, storytelling in general. Star Wars is doing the same thing. Um, I, I wouldn't put it past other <laughs> canons to do the same thing, but like, uh, I don't think the whole like obviously you can do ex- explore stories in one-off fashion yeah. that like explore a certain time period, but I think that not knowing when the present is is a problem for these sorts of franchises. Well, the present is 2024. That's, that's our life. And <laughs> obviously this is fictional. You know, what, you know what we're talking about. So, well, that's a, that's not a response. It, well, <laughs> you know what I'm talking if about. If I can finish. <laughs> I think there are lots of quote unquote present timelines in Star Trek. And in this day and age where we have several different shows going on, it might be confusing to new, li- to new uh, viewers about what's what exactly is going on and what century they're in. And that's its own issue as you know, and you're right. Star Wars is doing it as well. And as someone mm-hmm. who doesn't follow star Wars closely, it's confusing as shit. And I don't know when anything is right. taking place. Mm-hmm. So that's a great point. How are you bringing in new people by having several different things in different presents? Well, that's not even my problem with it. My problem is the classic prequel problem. Yeah. Which is like, you, 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 it's impossible to have like stakes because you know, like every time the Federation is at threat in Strange New Worlds, I know they make it. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, unless they're doing a time, ch- like a, a universe shift or whatever, which I don't think they're doing most of the time. So it's like, I, every time things are at threat, I, I just know they're not really going to happen. Like, you can't threaten Earth. You can't really threaten this. You can't, like, it just sort of feels like they, as long as you want it to be in the same canon, even loosely as something like Next Generation, you can't do big swings on Strange New Worlds. Now, you can do big swings for certain characters, mm. but you can't do big swings for, like, universe ending stakes, which, like, we don't need all the time, but sometimes they're fun. Like, if you use them sparingly, like DS9 did, where it's like, Oh, I don't know how this war is going to shake out. Like at the end of the Dominion War, who are going to be friends of the Federation? You know, like the Romulans could have gone in on the other side. And there's all that interesting. So my point is not that like you need a like like not about bringing in new people. My point is like I like having a place in the timeline where I don't know anything past this point. All of the options are open. You know what I mean? Like, this could be the end of the Federation. And what does that do? This could be a war that threatens the very, like, fabric of existence. What would that mean? You know what I mean? Like, what if the Klingons and the Federation are no longer allies or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, that, like, those things matter. But when you have this show that's 3,000 years in the future, it's like, well, we know that nothing major is going to happen. Or, like, yeah, I don't know. And I mean, they've been a little like uh coy with too much detail for that reason i think mm-hmm. but like you know it's not like they sit down and give us a timeline of everything that happened with the fall of the federation well i do think that the quote-unquote present timeline of star trek at the moment is discoveries time especially since they're spinning off that show into starfleet academy and it will also be in the 32nd century yeah 
and I mean Lower Decks is ending. Prodigy, who knows? We're about we're going to get a second season. France already got a second season because mm-hmm. um, <laughs> they screwed up. And Strange New Worlds fits in a very specific pocket time bit that like works for you know prequel and being close to the original series. Yeah. So I and I don't know what they're doing because the 2009 prequel uh, they're they put on the slate. It might not happen. They've put. Uh, Starfleet. Uh, uh, they put another uh, Star uh, Abrams verse, Kelvin verse movie on the slate a couple years ago or last year or something, and then realize, oh, we can't do that. Yeah. And but importantly, they're also trying to sell Paramount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the big. So thing. they're trying to whip out all their dicks and go like, this is all the things we have, and right. whether or not that shakes out. Well, we'll see. I, I won't believe it until I'm watching the end credits. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But, um, you know, and, and then again, you know, uh, we've also got Section 31 coming. I don't know where that's going. I don't know what what the point of that is other than Michelle Yo, And we got to make sure it happens now. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Now that we have her under contract for it and she's an Oscar winner, we got to get that show on the <laughs> like going. And it's just a movie now. And Ash Tyler's not in it. And. God, I'm angry about that because I love Ash Tyler and I really wanted to see where he was going. Me too. I'll be damned. I want Ash Tyler somewhere in this universe. And if it means a prequel, I'll take it. Yeah. Well, and that's the, that's the problem with constant prequels. And that's why I'm exactly saying I think a present, having a present is important because like your constant prequels breed more constant prequels. And like, I just think the the having a point where we don't know anything about the future is important to storytelling. Otherwise, it's constant dramatic irony. You know what I mean? Like that's everything. Every like dramatic irony is a great thing, but like constant dramatic irony is is frustrating. <laughs> well, on on some level, but you know, there are certain projects, certain storylines that like where I like knowing that you know certain things are going to play out. A, they have to play out a certain way because. You know, I don't like big universe ending storylines generally anyway. I'm much more in favor of like quiet story, like character based stories and like what this means for this. And, you know, like if we know this and this and this doesn't happen, what does that mean? Like who, who, you know, it's like look at Pale Moonlight on DS9. You know, do you know the Dominion's going to lose? You just know they are. There's no way they're going to end Star Trek Deep Space Nine. With the Dominion crushing Starfleet. Yeah, but like whether the Romulans join or not is like going to set up the relationship between the Romulans and the Federation for the rest of Star Trek. You know what I mean? That's right. But so like even that episode matters so much to Star Trek. Like it informs everything that follows it, you know? Yes, but the mo- the most interesting thing about that episode is how Cisco was willing to compromise his own character sure, and his own but morality. It, yeah, that's all great, great. But if you know the results of the thing, then you're watching him worry about a thing that you know the answer to, which is dramatic irony. That's my point. Like, mm-hmm. you're watching... Like, so let's say we know that... We've already seen <laughs> Picard, let's say, and we know yeah. that the Federation and the Romulans have these, like groups that are working together to dismantle Borg stuff. You know what I mean? Like they, we know that they're sort of working together in the future. So we know they Mm -hmm. get together. So we're watching him fret in this insane way over something that we like know the answer to. And it makes us feel constantly like uh, it makes us feel way less connected to his character in that episode. I think, um, because mm-hmm. we're 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 watching it from this like God view where we know the future instead of watching it from like in his shoes in that moment, mm-hmm. and like we and we feel the stakes of that the first time we watch it, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm not I'm not arguing it's not dramatic irony. I'm arguing that there's a real place for it and it can be done beautifully and wonderfully and you know just because it's a prequel does you know there's plenty of. Uh, territory to explore in a prequel i agree i'm not saying there's not i'm just saying like it is important to have a current timeline with the age of the actors and characters uh that are most known i'm concerned that the current timeline is going to remain that sort of post tng era post uh, ds9 era and now picard like that era is going to be that our new like normal 
mm-hmm. because especially after the uh, reception to Picard and like the the viewership and everything. But then we now have this Discovery show that's like out in the future, sort of setting all these points for us of what's going on. But that that may get undone. Like they may do well. I don't know. Now that we know that Tilly's getting her own spinoff show with Starfleet Academy, like that may not get undone. Um, I don't know. Yeah, like I I think. And I, God, I hope that we get Star Trek Legacy at some point. Yeah, me too. But then I do feel like I, I, I hate to admit it, but like I feel like every episode that there are major stakes, I'll be going like, is this where the Federation starts messing up and we start seeing the downfall of the Federation? You know, <laughs> like, is this the beginnings of the recession of the Federation? Like go backsliding and losing planets? Um, and it's just like, I wish I didn't know that was coming. You know, I, I want this like constant fear for the bad, that the bad thing's going to happen and hope that the good thing's going to happen. Like that's mm-hmm. that storytelling. And then if you know certain points in the future, it just sort of gives you this like whatever. I mean, it can be used to great effect. Obviously we're watching Pike right now. We know his future. Well, it's kind of the point with Pike right now is like, he knows his future and he knows he can change it if he wants to, or he can try. Um, and that's sort of the interesting part. Yeah. But there will be huge repercussions. Yes, indeed. Well, my friend, it has been a great time chatting with you. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good week. Um, and we'll be back with more star Trek, uh, in the next, uh, next week with the uh, next episode of discovery. Yep. And I'm going to post another TRO- TOS review. With me and Effie. Sweet. In between, so. Good, 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 good. Um, well, uh, Jolan True. Oh, by the way, happy 250 episodes. We hit that last hey, time. Hey, thanks, man. <laughs> Yay, 250 episodes. That's wild. Uh, live, live long and prosper and all that stuff. Whatever. Yeah. We ended the 250 episodes so so tightly. Well, this is 251, so it doesn't count. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, sweet. Doesn't matter then. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 